My aim is to share with you what I think are the most important things that I've learnt about getting clean air in cities over the last 10 years. Perhaps I can just start at the end by giving you an example. Last night I tweeted Greg Hunt and Jamie Briggs, congratulations. That tweet of mine was seen by over 65,000 people. Over 800 people actually did something with it and 100 people favorited it or retweeted it. Now just imagine if I tweeted again and said that what we would like to achieve is action on one atmosphere with World Health Organization guidelines enforced where people live and not away from busy roads and, and so on, but also a more ambitious climate policy. It just gives you a sense of what this is actually about. I'd like to now go back to the beginning and this is what I'm going to cover. To start with, how did I get into this? I was campaigning against rat running through local streets. We took the local council to the High Court, we won, they had to redo their consultation again. But what I found out is that there is no point trying to persuade politicians to do things that they don't want to do and don't have to do. And somebody told me how bad pollution was, so I did what I have done in the past, spent a couple of days looking at the internet, and I found out how bad pollution was near Harrods, but also that there are actually powerful laws in place to do something about it. And that's how I got involved in this process. We needed a mission and that is the mission to achieve full compliance with World Health Organization guidelines for air quality throughout London and elsewhere. So it's very much a health mission, not a legal mission, although we do use the powerful laws in place. We've had three guiding principles, I would say. The first is this, which is really about one atmosphere, which is about saying there is air pollution and there are greenhouse gases. I'll give you some examples those things have been considered separately. This matrix, a couple of columns, one is about air pollution, the other is about greenhouse gases, and London, rest of world. The idea here is that people who talk about complying with climate targets in 2020, 2050, to my mind are no different to generals behind the front lines, 20 miles behind the front lines in a chateau in the First World War, drawing sweeping lines to invade through France or Germany, depending on which side of the front line they're on. This is basically air pollution stuff is about complying with things which in Oxford Street, our busiest shopping street in London, are breached by a factor of three and a half times the World Health Organization guideline and legal limit. Now conversely, if we actually comply with air pollution laws, World Health Organization guidelines in that top left box, we can basically show everyone how to achieve their wider climate and sustainability objectives. And so I really do think that if we think holistically about one atmosphere, we'll actually achieve a lot more. Traffic management, to me, is really about two overlapping circles. There's an emission circle, a congestion circle. You tackle one of these, it does help slightly the other. But it's very important that we don't think that we're actually addressing air quality or air pollution when we tackle congestion directly. And this is the sort of principle which I call the London principle, which is basically just about making trade-offs between the greenhouse gases and, and air pollution. So if you actually say, we will not do anything on air pollution if it makes CO2 1% worse, you are handicapping yourself and you will never achieve anything. And the classic example is you actually end up doing something really stupid. You end up with diesel, which is the plague of Europe at the moment. I've spent 10 years really trying to build media interest and public understanding about air pollution. And this is a classic example of the way I've done it. Oxford Street breaches the annual legal limit for nitrogen dioxide on about the 4th, sometimes it's the 5th of January. So that's me standing there with the TV crew at the end of the first week in January highlighting this problem. Quite different to fighting rat running traffic. Here I've just got to say the government's breached the, the air pollution laws again. These are some of the media outlets that have covered the work that I've done over the last 10 years. You can see it's a, a very international lot. 
What I have found in building public understanding is that it's actually an awful lot easier to build public understanding and warn the public. And you can see here a, a chap in London, a cyclist who's uh, wearing a mask. I've done a sort of informal survey and I think one in 20 cyclists in London now wears a mask. Of course, these things don't protect you, particularly from the fine particles and gases, uh, but they clearly do something. But what I have found uh, is it's an awful lot easier to warn the general public uh, than politicians. I don't know whether they don't want to listen or too busy, but this is a survey I've done a couple of times through a parliamentary polling organisation. Survey of 100 MPs, they have been asked to rank the five public health risks, so going from smoking, obesity, alcoholism, road traffic accidents and air pollution. All of the parties ranked air pollution at least fourth out of those five and the Conservatives, who are currently the government, ranked air pollution um, fifth, which is behind road traffic accidents. And of course, statistically speaking, in London, in the UK, in Europe in fact, about ten times as many people are killed statistically from air pollution as road traffic accidents. And that is just from PM 2.5, and we'll talk more about nitrogen dioxide. So the politicians, frankly, haven't got a clue. Now that is really quite troubling, particularly after ten years some key milestones and successes. I'd just like to highlight a few of these. It was getting started. I accused of being very even-handed about this campaign. I accused the previous government, Labour government, a couple of governments ago of one of the biggest public health cover-ups uh, or failings for not disclosing the number of attributable deaths from long-term exposure to PM 2.5. That was a very brave moment when I sent that off, but it was actually investigated by three parliamentary inquiries and my numbers were confirmed. And when Frank Kelly, who's the, Professor Kelly, who's the chairman of the Committee on Medical Effects of Air Pollutants, and was sitting in front of one of these parliamentary inquiries and was asked, you know, about these Clean Air in London numbers, and he said, well, they're about right. You've never seen 10 MPs sit bolt upright in a room before in your life because they, of course, were expecting him to say, well, the guy's a lunatic. The Olympics, a, a tremendous focus. We achieved a lot there. And that's really when we got a lot of NGOs involved. So there were really only two or three NGOs, but really there are now probably 100 organisations campaigning throughout the UK. The Europeans' Clean Air Policy Package in 2013 had two um, objectives. One is to achieve full compliance with air pollution laws throughout Europe by uh, 2020. And the second one is something called the National Emissions Ceilings Directive, which is about um, our policy action on sources. And I have a new role since the beginning of this year, UNEP, United Nations Environment Programme, as something called the High Level Intergovernmental and Stakeholder Advisory Group for its Global Environment Outlook number six. They've never had NGOs on that before, so they're having a bit of trouble getting used to listening to us. There are 26 member states and eight NGOs, and I'm the air pollution bod, so that's quite fun. This is the Mayor of London. We've produced a few cartoons, and he and I are actually on speaking terms, you'll be pleased to hear. Campaigning is quite a subtle art. The Mayor can't do anything unless there's somebody actually saying there's a big problem here, do something, and then what I typically trot out with is he hasn't gone far enough, fast enough, and of course he loves that. Background and context. Air pollution laws are about particles and gases. Particles in a lump, gases, nitrogen dioxide is the one that we particularly worry about. And I'd just like to highlight one thing there, which is that in July this year, King's College London published the first estimates for mortality from nitrogen dioxide. This is absolutely stunning. Historical perspective, I'd just like to make two points here. First is that in 1952, we had the Great Smog, which was about short-term exposure to visible air pollution. Now we have long-term exposure to invisible air pollution. The World Health Assembly discussed air pollution, debated it for the very first time at its 68th meeting in May this year. They have asked the World Health Organization to produce an air quality plan for their meeting next May. In a sense, uh, I think we're back where we thought we were 60 years ago. Air pollution affects absolutely everyone. Just because it's not short-term visible exposure, people think it's respiratory, it's not. There is really a huge lack of understanding about this. I've got two slides on the focus on CO2. Just look at the second last sentence there. 
This is something that came out in an excellent article by John Vidal, one of the Guardian articles. Basically, this is where a senior civil servant ad admitted to him that they decided to kill people through diesel pollution, thinking that it was worth the CO2 savings. It's absolutely unbelievable some of the things that were done on, based on this myopic focus on just one part of one atmosphere. Give you another example of a stupid policy. This is London just before the Olympics. You can see that's quite a heavy particle smog or particle episode. The mayor's approach to that just before the Olympics uh, was to use something which I dubbed the pollution suppressor, and you'll see why. That's basically it. Using this thing three times a day, spraying calcium magnesium acetate on the road surface, he managed to reduce PM10 levels by up to 49% just in front of the monitor on the Olympic route network. <laughs> now, I had to hunt this quite hard because they made it very hard for me to find this thing. I tracked it down through freedom of information requests to being used at certain times of the day or night. I spent one night standing by the Marlborough Road Monitor, which is the one officially used to report legal breaches and warn of smog episodes. Spent the whole evening there and nothing happened. Then I saw it as I was going home at about two in the morning, sort of zooming like a rabbit down Park Lane. I went back the following night and was a bit luckier. Within about 10 minutes, this thing appeared, flashing lights coming down the road. So I took a video of it spraying calcium magnesium acetate just before the Olympics in front of the main London monitor. And then I hailed a cab and said, follow those flashing lights. And that was really great fun, I can tell you. They really did not like it when I tweeted a photo of that. You can see here it had no effect. That's uh, the beginning of next year. All it does is hide the results and the legal breaches. Some lessons. I really do think we should focus on one atmosphere, not uh, forget indoor air quality, of course. It's very easy to think that offsetting's the answer. You know, we'll plant trees or we'll put up green walls or something like that. But really, we need to tackle this problem at its source. Situation now. Health effects, I'm sure all of you in this room will know that there is no safe level of exposure to PM2.5. They've certainly found health effects down to about six micrograms per cubic meter. These are some of the emerging problems. Particles, of course, and new health effects being identified all the time. Nitrogen dioxide, traffic-related air pollution, Ozone, I have to say I'm very concerned about nanoparticles. I asked a scientist, a professor, how he thought those health effects appeared, and he said they would probably appear as sort of degenerative diseases in many years to come. Another cartoon, World Health Organization, our friend Boris, he really does lend himself to cartoons. We produced a calendar. On a very serious note, though, in contrast, three British soldiers died tragically during SAS selection, in fact one after SAS selection a couple of years ago. This really just shows the particle levels and the ozone levels on the day they were doing this selection exercise. I've tried to get the authorities, the coroner, health and safety executive, the police, others to pay attention to this and it certainly should be investigated whether air pollution like this caused or contributed to those three tragic deaths. No one outside the air pollution community has actually expressed any interest in this whatsoever, and I find that um, really quite shocking. In Europe, governance is behind a lot of progress in air pollution laws, or in complying with air pollution standards and protecting public health. In Europe, we've got rules at three levels. We've got European rules which apply across the whole continent. We've got action in national courts and we have the planning system as well. Clean and London is getting an opinion from a leading QC about the enforcement of, of those laws in the planning system. That will have a large impact. I mentioned before that we're working on this um, new national emission ceiling directive, but if you are interested in getting into the sort of legal side of things, I really would encourage you to see what Client Earth has done. I think they've been involved in some of the CO2 work in Australia, but they rather brilliantly lost in the High Court, lost in the Court of Appeal, and then won spectacularly in the Supreme Court, which meant that the government couldn't do anything about it. So uh, there really is a lesson there if you're trying to uh, enforce these laws. 
sources of air pollution. The main point I'd highlight here is that it's very easy to think everything sort of comes within cities, but for particles in London, about three quarters of the particles, PM2.5 within London, actually come from outside. There's been some new scientific work saying a very high proportion of the PM2.5 background emissions come from agriculture. We have got a terrible problem with methane and ammonia and other precursors. Whereas nitrogen dioxide, of course, is a very local pollutant. It gets sort of blown away quite quickly. In Europe, let me put it this way, you know, China, India, Eastern Europe have a terrible particle problem. But in Western Europe, we've got a catastrophic diesel problem. And the best measure of that is that King's College scientist, Dr. David Carslaw, said that many roads in central London will tend to have the highest concentrations of nitrogen dioxide in the world, the highest levels in the world, and that's because of 8,500 diesel buses, 22,000 diesel taxis, um, and a whole lot, of course, of diesel trucks and, and cars. About one in two new cars in the UK has been a diesel car, whereas, of course, those market shares are much lower in Australia. In case you're relying on Euro standards to solve this problem, I know you've used Euro standards a lot, but Euro 6 um, is most definitely failing for diesel. There's been some real world testing and, and real world emissions much higher of NOx um, than we would expect from the European standard. Also, very significantly, what the manufacturers have done, because there isn't actually a sort of a regulation on NO2 other than it's got to be less than the NOx total, obviously, NO2 as a percentage of NOx has gone from about 10% 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's up to 75%, certainly over 70%, 70% in motorway driving of one of the vehicles tested recently. Just by thinking that NOx is going down, which actually it isn't because real world's much higher than the emission standards, the NO2 fraction within those NOx emissions is absolutely rocketing. The government's favourite explanation for air pollution episodes in London is actually Sahara dust. That's very popular. You find ministers trot that out all the time. Even when we did have a, a bit of Sahara dust um, in spring last year, it was really only about 10% um, of the episode. Solutions, just some general principles here. We do need to build public understanding, and to me that is about warning people and giving people advice about protecting themselves and reducing pollution for themselves and others. And of course that aligns very nicely with the mitigation and adaptation that we need to do in respect of climate work. Very much one atmosphere. Of course we need political leadership and I think uh, one of the things I've said to UNEP is a, some sort of hierarchy of um, solutions. When the European Commission looked at its clean air policy package, when they looked at that clean air policy package, of course they did what people normally do which is focus on a percentage of the maximum technically feasible reduction. They don't take into account what can be done through lifestyle changes or just banning or shutting the most inexcusable activities. And I think that's a big lesson here. We need to think of policy in a much wiser way. Of course, most lifestyle changes actually save money, not costing it. We do need to throw everything at it, including the kitchen sink, but you'll know that from working in the field. This is just a sort of silly picture. That was in the mayor's impact assessment. It just shows what he thought could be achieved if he banned tailpipe emissions in central London, sort of nice and blue. Of course, that's not what he's proposing. Social media. I think it is wonderfully powerful. It's very cheap to get these messages out. I've looked at Twitter versus Facebook. What I found is that really Twitter has small inputs and big outputs, whereas Facebook I found really was some quite a lot more inputs to achieve the outputs. What I really love about Twitter is that you can literally reach anyone anywhere or everyone everywhere. Now that is astonishing. So for example, you know, if I tweet to Greg Hunt, Jamie Briggs, you can be pretty sure that someone is actually watching that. If they follow me, I can direct message them, and that'll mean that it'll actually probably go through to their mobile phone as an SMS. If they don't like it, they may block you, but um, you know, so be it. I block people all the time. Not ministers, I would add.
Twitter did a case study, their first ever Europe, Middle East and Africa case study, how with Twitter advertising go from about 4,000 followers to 12,000 followers. This is the app. I'm a bit embarrassed calling it the Burkitt Index, but I was told by the patent people that that was the best way to protect it. But it's really two things. One is, to my knowledge, it was the first ever index for long-term exposure to a public health risk which is what those sort of colours are down the left. And that's because I got very frustrated with the air quality alerts every day, which for 330 days a year uh, say it's low. And of course, that's not the reality as we know. So I invented this. Um, it's had about 4,000 downloads, covers every local authority in England using Department of Health data. And actually, because it's just based on a spreadsheet, um, it could be done anywhere in the world. The circles show the number of deaths attributable to PM 2.5 and 15 seconds before the next one it starts flashing at you. Some big hits in terms of getting community engagement, this is the sort of thing which I've found is really effective. The media loves nothing more than the government breaking the law or deaths or disease. What I'm trying to do is a very sort of you know, powerful, positive message. Whenever I do a media interview, I always write at the top of the piece of paper, opportunity, and I'll come on to the fact that I think there's a huge opportunity to re-engineer our cities and protect public health. I put in a freedom of information request to Transport for London. You can imagine they really love me. And uh, I asked them for schools within 150 metres of busy roads because that's what the scientists in California had said. Um, you know, there was a causal link for the first time to asthma. I got a list back of over a thousand schools within 150 metres of busy roads in London. Well, all of these really were the top um, news item uh, for a whole day in London or more widely. I asked Transport for London for another request, which was um, diesel emissions by regulated pollutant by category of vehicle for every road link in London. Turned out there are 41,000 road links in London. I gave it to all the parties because what I do is very political but non-party. I gave it to all the parties. Uh, the Greens actually mapped it and of course it's a very powerful picture. Another freedom of information request this time to the um, Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, asking for the most polluted places in the UK. The list came back and the Sunday Times, being of course great communicators, spotted that Grosvenor Place is actually the back of Buckingham Palace. You can imagine the headlines uh, on that. They ran it as an exclusive and it was picked up by every uh, national newspaper within about two or three hours. Getting livable cities. We've talked about what is the problem and how you actually sort of reach people, but you know, what are the solutions? I'll talk about this in sort of different categories, uh, London, Europe and so on. We do need to build public understanding. Illegal wood burning banned by the Clean Air Act is still responsible for about 5 to 10 percent of annual mean PM across London. One of the things that amazes me about that uh, is that it's actually sort of people who think that they're being environmentally friendly by burning wood, you know, in a log fire in the middle of London on a, on a weekend evening. Our problem is diesel, diesel, diesel. It's responsible for 90 to 95 percent of the PM 2.5 exhaust emissions and NO2 exhaust emissions, so there is no way in the world we can reduce those harmful transport emissions in cities without, in effect, banning diesel as we banned coal so successfully 60 years ago from the most polluted places in our cities. That's not to say we have to ban it outside cities, but diesel and people do not mix, and that is something which there's an awful lot of evidence about it. It's also, to me, uh, this idea of um, banning diesel as we banned coal so successfully 60 years ago. It's not just about sort of thumping one thing. I think this is actually about opportunity. This is actually about re-engineering our cities. Let's encourage all the really good things. I've been very uh, pleasantly surprised by the large number of cyclists in Melbourne, for example. Melbourne seems a much more pedestrianised city in the, in the heart than it was when I was here even sort of two and a half, three years ago. Now, let's encourage all of those really good things and let's come up with uh, ways of discouraging the bad things. It's not saying don't drive a vehicle, it's basically saying 
drive a smaller vehicle and preferably petrol or hybrid or, or electric. But let's not forget um, tyre and brake wear because even when you deal with all of the exhaust emissions you're still going to have tyre and brake wear. The one thing I would sort of add to that list is agriculture. I mean it is a huge UK problem but it's also a huge European problem. This National Emission Ceilings Directive that's being worked on at the moment, the farming lobby is intensely trying to stop us having binding limits across Europe and they don't want ammonia or methane subject to that sort of binding limit. It's inexcusable, it's the sort of classic low-hanging fruit and they're, they're a very powerful lobby. Talked a bit about emissions versus congestion measures I sat down with one of the mayor's deputy mayors and we talked about the sort of emission-based road charging which is a way of really combining congestion and emission measures and she had this spectacular idea which is that what we ought to do is charge the most polluting vehicles for driving at the busiest times of day in the worst possible places. We ought to charge them and in effect have an emissions um, or pollution sort of trading system where we actually use the money from those people to pay people to walk or cycle. Pay people to walk or cycle. Now that's a sort of revolution that I'm talking about, very positive. And this is the mayor's ultra low emission zone. He started by proposing a ban of the most polluting vehicles from 2020. And after a couple of years, um, he did what he's always done on air pollution measures. He took um, several backward steps and we ended up saying that any diesel car could come in uh, and pay £12.50 a day to drive around London whenever they felt like it. It is already shaping up to be a top two or top three issue for the London mayoral elections next May. Australia and New Zealand challenges, a bit loath to try and tell you what your challenges are and I'm even more loath, you'll see the big question mark on the next slide, to tell you what the solutions might be. You do have some quite intense issues. Australia has some very big challenges with dust storms. We've got big problems with sort of wood burning, and I'm very conscious of that, and that's a sort of New Zealand problem as well as an Australian problem. Newcastle apparently is the biggest coal port in the world. I mean, the traffic that goes with that in terms of um, uh, diesel trains, of course, the impact of stockpiles and so on, while we have to be careful about you know, what is coal and what is, for example, wood burning during the winter, uh, but I think there are some um, very big issues there. The Americans are shutting down coal-fired power station after coal-fired power station. Europe, there are no more being built. They're being shut down in the UK. You know, China's already indicated that that's its direction of travel. And I think it's time to really look uh, beyond coal. Um, coal is definitely part of the problem here. Please don't forget shipping and sort of Sydney ferries. I'm always amazed when I see the Sydney ferries just chugging out stuff right in the middle of Circular Quay. Solutions, again, you'll see some similarities. Quick mention about my work with UNEP. This was in Nairobi in March. These are some of the things just about uh, GEO6. What is it? It's a five yearly report which has been produced since the days of Rio. It looks at state and trends of the global environment, which is air, land, water, and biota, which is every living thing, which is a bit of a task, of course, for them. Looking at policies, looking at outlook. I said to them, well, you know, why haven't you had more impact from these reports in the past? And they said, well, we don't like to say anything controversial in policies. So, um, I think we may be able to change that. The two things I said to them, one, let's look in this next report due in stages to 2018. Let's look at one atmosphere. Yes, there's a separate UN group on climate, of course, you know that better than I do. But let's think in terms of one atmosphere and let's look at this policy hierarchy. Regional air pollution issues, these are some of the things which are sort of coming out sort of bottom up from the process which has gone on over the last few months. There are some things here which won't surprise you like sort of transport and coal and city emissions, also agriculture, emerging concerns and so on. But actually governance keeps cropping up around the world as an issue and to me governance is about the way we run things. So it's setting the right standards, having laws in place so that people can actually get access to information and also of course that people have access to justice to enforce those uh, laws and rules. Next steps. 
Australia, New Zealand, a new Prime Minister, and the same Environment Minister, and a, a brand new Minister for Cities and um, the Built Environment. But what I would really like to see is, you know, clean air standards as part of the National Clean Air Agreement. I'd like to see standards which are very close to or at the World Health Organization guidelines. Importantly, that they actually apply where people live and work. There is no point having them sort of the back of the black stump or something like that. They need to apply where people live and work. Uh, we need monitors to um, show the results on that. Also, uh, in my view, um, Malcolm Turnbull um, will have to come up with a new position uh, on climate. I don't think it is sustainable for Malcolm Turnbull to come up with the same position at those COP21 meetings in Paris. Given that, he was an environment minister. So um, uh, if you can imagine the beating that Tony Abbott took on that, I think Malcolm Turnbull will have a more difficult time. But I think it is an opportunity. What he ought to do is sort out the economy and do it in a sustainable way, which is actually about re-engineering um, the economy over the medium and, and longer term. I think he will do that. We'll wait and see. But I think it's a very exciting time to be in Australia or New Zealand. Internationally, we have some European legislation we're working on this, the National Emissions Ceilings Directive. We have, for the very first time, three measures included in the new Sustainable Development Goals on air pollution. And I think that's uh, a huge development. COP21 in Paris, and of course next May, the World Health Assembly 69th meeting, which um, uh, is when the World Health Organization will pre present the plan that they were asked to produce at the last meeting. And UNEP, of course, producing reports in stages. Next steps for Clean Air in London. The mayoral election next year, as I said, it's already shaping up air pollution and the related sort of traffic issues to be a, certainly a top three issue, or certainly a top five issue in the last mayoral election in 2012 in London Assembly. Housing is sort of up there because guess what, the sort of mayoral candidates love housing, not just because it's a huge problem and it is a great concern to people, uh, most definitely, but actually because guess what, they can have targets and they don't really need to be held accountable for anything. So they love having that as their sort of top thing. Air pollution and traffic problems, diesel in particular, is being absolutely forced into their agenda. The 5th of July 2016 is the 60th anniversary of the first Clean Air Act nationally. There was actually one a couple of years before that just for the City of London, the square mile. But I think that is a fantastic opportunity really to have a new clean air revolution exactly 60 years after the last. That is about encouraging the good things and taking some really big action to have fewer cleaner vehicles, deal with some of the emission sources, whether it's coal or agriculture. If we can crack these problems, we really can show people everywhere how to achieve wider one atmosphere objectives. And that's certainly having campaigned for 10 years, my next five years is sort of focused on this sort of one atmosphere approach of trying to get people to think holistically, which is to look at CO2, greenhouse gases and air pollution together, stop making these really stupid decisions that we made about diesel or promoting biomass in cities. And I think if we do that, there is a fantastic opportunity and that's the, the message I'd like to leave you on. Thank you.